So the reason that the Japanese do it the way they do it is because they know if the player package is rock solid, everything else becomes easy. Right. And that's why we that we made Met the Metroid Prime games that way. The reason they were successful is we nailed our player package up front. Right. And so that that's why uh, you made we made little linear progress over the first half of the game because we were prototyping everything and making sure the whole player package was rock solid and perfect. And then poured the rest of the game in the second half of production. Because now we've established everything. We know everything works. It's going to be a fun game. The rest of it is just adding it to the rest of the world. Um, so when I design games, the thing that's most important to me, the single most important thing is design, right? Making sure that your design is nailed before you spend any revs going down dry holes because scale creep is what you do when you panic, mm. right? So, oh, this isn't coming together. We've got to come up with something. Story will never sell a game. Right? I've always thought that, but it seems like yeah. the, the, the AAA industry especially is focusing more on story and graphics. Yeah, because... Like, like because E3, E3, like you won't even see gameplay. You'll see a cinematic. Yeah, because that they're because they're marketing, because what they're doing is they're making videos. This is about videos and putting it up on YouTube and it's visual hype, right? So, but look at the size of their teams though. I mean, Call of Duty, they're spending what? Half a billion dollars? To make one, some, yeah. ri- some some ridiculous amount of money, right? With with a foul like a thousand developers on staff, mm. you know, what, you know, and that's because and, and each of those developers does that tiny little thing. Like, what do you do? I make rocks, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or I make you know. And, and what's weird about it is uh, early on in the Japanese production uh, environment. They would have these big teams where everyone would have a tiny, tiny little thing. Like there, I remember at the time, Sony had a, a guy whose job was making uh, four pixel by four pixel texture maps. And that's it. Sixty. That's what he did. Yeah. Like a hundred hours a week. <laughs> I, I know. I just set, set myself on fire. That's, uh, thank, thanks. I'll pass. And Nintendo is all about making a prototype. You can throw fancy illustrations and storyboards at them all day they're not impressed until they can play it and we were able to to get playable prototypes so uh, basically the dk jumping around gray boxes scattered all over the place um we were able to get these prototypes in front of them very quickly and then just soak up that feedback and this feedback was down to the pixel level uh, try this try this you know uh, change the the ground pounding cadence. Uh, you know, one more pixel here. Um, you know, give him the ability to perch and lean over. Uh, you know, these blocks. Um, and it, it was just this steady stream of really valuable guidance that these early prototypes were able to bring forth that made the project as a whole much more straightforward than if um, we had been with any other publisher. I'm convinced. Because you've been, you've obviously worked for different gaming companies. Because I'm, I'm pretty sure not all of them would want that, right? They want to nope. some, some want to pitch via a story or an outline as opposed to a prototype. <laughs> one of the publishers, one of the larger publishers I worked with previously, used to joke, if um, your your design document, your initial design document, wasn't the thickness of a uh, phone book, keep trying. What? <laughs> yes, and they would literally joke as we sat down for the design document review process. Um, you know, this feels about right. As they're literally, you know, you know, holding three or four hundred pages in their hands. Yeah, this feels about right. That that represented the amount of diligence that a team was supposed to have put into the process before even they got into a, a prototype. They, that's that's the difference between the Nintendo process and a, and a lot of other developers. I'm sorry to say, Nintendo's way of giving developers it's something uh mark pacini liked to say a lot which was freedom to fail um giving them that ability to figure things out and to work through problems even if it meant spending some money or being late as long as you could show that you're being thoughtful nintendo let you do what you needed to do to get things done again as long as you're smart and as long as you're thoughtful um it's Oftentimes, not like that um, with a lot of uh, folks in the West. A, a lot of the time, it's uh, you have to put like a huge amount of um, upfront documentation. You have to pre-think a lot of things, even though they're things that you really need to prototype. You need to 
work out. But prototyping costs money and figuring things out costs time and money. And so you end up having to sort of make these pitch documents and these um, these grandiose salesy things that are ultimately salesy and aren't going to be discovered until the process is there. And so that was that was a very very difficult thing and a lot of a lot of like the business development and stuff actually fell on my shoulders um during during the armature stuff and it was fascinating because i saw inside of it and i saw how the financials work and to be completely honest like the way that a lot of this industry is sort of financed and the way pitches go forward it's it you kind of have to fake it till you make it or you have to have the capital to be able to burn through prototyping before someone will give you money. And um, and it was a very, very difficult, difficult thing to go through. Because I find it bizarre. I mean, Mike Wicken touched on this as well. But like, I would think because video games are an interactive medium, that prototyping would be the way to go as opposed to a massive pitch document. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, well, it's not just massive pitch documents, but like, for instance, a lot of the way the deals get structured is that they want, when you're going to do a prototype, they want to do an entire long form agreement of the entire game, get that done with their legal departments to make sure that the game is going to happen before you start the prototype. Ah. Uh -huh. And so what that ends up doing is it ends up negating a lot of what you're doing in the prototype anyway, because you still have to figure out how much the whole thing is going to cost for this thing that you really don't know that much about. Again, unless you do all this upfront prototyping work, which is money that you ultimately never recoup or almost never recoup. Because the way financing is done in video games for any independent developer is essentially, you know you're it's it's like a book deal you're borrowing against royalties that you may or may not make and so if you if you borrow if it costs you say i'm this is just i'm just throwing yeah, yeah, yeah. bad numbers if you borrowed like a thousand dollars to make your game and then your game only makes three hundred dollars you still get your thousand dollars right but that borrowing starts when the contract with the publisher starts. So if you do a bunch of prototyping up front and then bring that prototype to a publisher, whatever you've spent on that prototype will only come out of profits that you get. But because, you know, let's, I'm just going to throw a number out there. Let's say that your royalty is 20%. You spend $1,000 on the game. You have to make $5,000 before you see one more dollar in profit. And only then that's when you can start to pay off your prototype phase right has that become so a bit it, so does it make sense to does it make sense to make a prototype if there's a chance your game won't make money then you'll never get paid back for that prototype okay but then why if does you make it on your own dime yeah I mean, i'm sorry yeah no, no, no. <laughs> that's all right but but then why would nintendo do it that way because obviously but, they must be doing something right if 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 that's the way they look at it if they're all about prototypes because they know that that's the right way to go. Mm. Like it's, it's all about, it's all about risk reward and it's about where you put your risk and where you see your reward. Right. And so, um, for one thing, you know, most of Nintendo's teams are internal and so yeah, they're of kind of seeing a lot of that as sunk costs anyway. Right. Yeah. But that's like, true. but like they do it that way, but it's also just, I think a Western way of doing business is almost it's one of not trusting the other party <laughs> by default, right? Yeah, yeah. Is like saying like, well, but what if you did this prototype and then you got another deal and walked away from us? Then we're just stuck with a prototype and we'd have to find another team. But you guys have special stuff. Like these are the kinds of things I heard. Like I'm not making this up. Like these are the fears that they have in the West of doing business of like, well, if we pay you to do a prototype, but then you walk after the prototype, we're stuck. So we need to do a whole long form agreement. But then, and if we do this long form agreement, it's good for you, except for all the places where we can terminate the agreement <laughs> and get out of it. You know, it's 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 such a different way of of where you mitigate risk and where you look at risk. And I think that like, you know, especially it's just a very different way of doing business, Japanese versus Western is 
you know, doing business with Japanese is a lot more handshakey. It's a lot more um, have a drink with the guy and or gal and uh, and trust than than it is worrying and wrangling your hands around legal documents.